hopefully you know this is the computer arts evening computer arts society evening at Eva, a traditional sort of monday night event where we talk about the society and show progress on the various projects we're involved in um this year we have a few things to report on one is that nick has stepped down as chair Ooh. although he's still a, a good friend he's just uh, rather busy and I've taken over as what I'm calling interim chair until we decide if you want someone else or I should be full time chair. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's Okay, well, that's, that's a good. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, and we also have some work to report on the archive. Now, I've talked about the archive at the last three EVAs online and off. And of course, not a huge amount happened because um, something else happened. I can't remember what it was. We started the um, archive in 2020, which was not the best like, business decision made. But if we've got through it all right, and it's um, been a positive thing. So progress report on the Computer Arts Archive. First, very quickly, we're a community interest company. It means we're an independent organisation with not charitable, um, status as such, not in case of charity, but social aims. Uh, it's a non-profit type of company that's designed to enable organisations who want to do some social good to avoid having all the le legislation of a charity to, to look at, although we may become a charity. We were established in 2020 um, with a plan to launch in June 2020. It didn't really happen. Um, I would say we're based in Leicester. We don't have to have a physical base, but I'm based in Leicester. And a lot of the work we're doing in terms of trying to create a, a base for ourselves is happening in Leicester. Naturally, we're closely associated with the Computer Arts Society. And we run two websites. There's the Computer Arts Society site itself and the Computer Arts Archive. I see the Computer Arts Society website being where the community shares information and where we share we're writing about um, historic um, digital art and the computer arts archive will be a growing database of the artifacts and things that we've collected we have a mission I won't read it out apart from to say important things we're a not-for-profit company <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't want money <laughs> it means that nobody is going to take billions out of the company I can't do that. There's no shareholder as such, shareholders. Um, and our goal really is to be of benefit to artists, audiences, curators, educators, and researchers. And collaboration is a key part of what we do. And have a, we have a general interest in ensuring that computer art is recognized as a significant contemporary art form. And of course, we work closely with the Computer Art Society, which was founded in 1968, so quite a long time ago. And really what we do is we collect things, we index them, we then exhibit them and publish catalogues. Um, okay. Is right, okay. Like a Google set. There's a few interests catalogues and The Google. I didn't really write this on the train up. <laughs> so, you know, sort of simple things that an archive ought to be doing, looking after stuff, indexing it, and then showing it to people, and um, hopefully sharing insights and knowledge about what we've got. We do have a methodology, and it's two. It's about collecting things in two areas. One is digital artworks. Um, I'm certainly very aware that the base, and I sometimes see this as almost like a pyramid structure, is the majority of things we get are probably going to be printed works um, and paper and other media. Because printed works are easy to collect, easy to store, easy to produce. And we do indeed have a lot of printed work. Video artwork, so time-based, VHS, disc, um, YouTube, we collect those. Screen-based work, so work that's running on video loops or whatever. Um, Screen-based works that are actually running on standard computer hardware and software, easier to collect and to maintain. Screen-based works that are running on specialist hardware and software, and then installation works. 
And as you move down that list, it becomes harder to collect and maintain things. Um, anybody who's tried to build a collection of digital artwork knows that this use a whole variety of different technologies. And some of those technologies don't last particularly well. You know, think of Flash or whatever, or Macromedia Director. Um, they were very important technologies 20 years ago. Oh, the <laughs> But we're aware of that and we're collecting them this way. A lot of our most of our work is printed, but we do have video works and some live screen based work, some recorded, some running live. For example, Paul sitting here has donated some of his generative artworks. They're, um, they run on a Mac or even a Raspberry Pi. And they will run fresh every time you run them. Uh, it's also important to collect contextualizing materials. So we try to collect publications, um, books, um, catalogues, newspaper reviews, and I'm quite keen on establishing the context of some of the historic artworks. So, for example, um, great magazine, Studio International, has a great section on cybernetic serendipity, very important ex exhibition. I made sure we had the whole year's um, Studio International, which will give you a great insight to what else was happening at the time. Um, Associated ephemera relating to the exhibitions, specific documentary material created to record the work, artist interviews, and that's for a great form, a great material to collect, and then where possible, algorithms and explanations by artists of the artworks that we're collecting. Again, as you move further up <laughs> down this list, it becomes harder to find some of these things. But it's an aspiration that our collection would be matched by these contextualizing materials, if you like, as our methodology. Um, some of the collections that we are now um, working with, we're building up a good computer art society collection. Now, you may be aware that the cash and technocultures projects, a lot of work in ensuring that the original computer art society archive was saved and ultimately it was donated to the um, VNA. But of course, it wasn't everything. We found additional things that missed that initial project. So we're trying to make sure that we capture those things. And also, there have been another 20 years of CAS since that project. Something Nick's going to be talking about. So we try to ensure that we've collected as much of the CAS materials as possible. We have an exhibition called CAS 50, which is now really our core an invited collection. We have um, moment 27 artists, but I'm trying to get it up to 36 this year. So we'll collect an original artwork from an artist, ideally donated in some form, and it goes into that collection. We're building an Eva archive. We have uh, a lot of boxes for Eva. Um, even though, um, is, out of all those boxes, the proceedings make up a relatively small part. We want to go through to ensure that where appropriate, we keep all of the EVA materials. So we have EVA London, I think all apart from maybe two um, EVA London conferences. We have EVA Venice, and we have a whole bunch of other ones. These were Jim, the founder of EVA's <coughs> um, personal collection. Um, we've got the additional material as well, and hopefully Nick over there will be up one day to Leicester to decide which stuff should be in the either collection and which stuff maybe should go back to Birkbeck as part of their collection. Um, we've been building up a pretty good Paul Brown collection. That includes original artworks that Paul has donated, video materials, but also an exhibition we put on some digital um, pieces and some recorded pieces and so on. Confident in saying that we could put on a good Paul Brown exhibition if somebody is interested. We have the collection of Edward Inatovich. It was his personal collection donated to the archive by the family. Um, that's a very important collection. We'll be going through it, we'll be looking for ideally a PhD student to get funding to go through that material, very important material. Uh, of course, if you don't know the name Edward Inatovich, I'm sure you'll know one of his artworks, The Senster, which was an early robotic artwork. Um, that really demonstrated how a small set of rules running on a computer could be used to give a, a robot complex behaviours. Mm -hmm. And those complex behaviours convince most people that it's a complex machine, an intelligence machine. And of course, it wasn't an intelligent machine, but it certainly reveals 
that you don't need a lot of information, a lot of highly powerful computer to convince people that you've created something intelligent. Um, we have materials from Stroud Cornock. Now, Stroud was a very important figure in the development of computer arts generally, but also particularly in the development of the computer arts um, faculty facility in Leicester. So we're looking at collecting materials there. We have the Micro Arts Collection, which is one of the exhibitions we've put on, um, which is Jeff Davis's ZX Spectrum created work. Um, we have a couple then of quite big names, Harold Cohen and Cybernetic Serendipity. These are personal collections that I've been building up for 20 years, and both of them I want to do a significant exhibition on, both Cybernetic Serendipity and Harold Cohen. I'll show you some materials in a minute. In fact, I'll show you, I've got a link up there. I'll show you the materials now. Mm -hmm. I have to go that, do that. And I'm going to do quite a bit on this, but I'm going to zip through it. This isn't live yet. Um, I'm running through the process of getting all of this done, but um, I haven't yet managed to make this live. So let's have a look at a couple of Harold Cohen, very significant figure. Um, we have background information, including a bunch of photographs that he took. Um, one of his last um, events in the UK, he it's a work in progress this. <laughs> Some nice, really nice pictures. We have bit more um, links to materials and then artwork so these are prints limited edition prints 2009 2005 Aaron drawings from 1990s um, a collection of lithographs that he did for Harold Pinter's homecoming well, not a lot of people realize in fact not a lot of people realize Harold Cohen was a successful artist before he went digital um, and this here, where he's producing materials, illustrations for books, is very interesting. And then some of his prints, the first folio series, we have those. Um, and then books, some of which are quite hard to get hold of. Now, I'm particularly interested in combining the materials we have here with materials that I've discovered in the Leicester City, Leicester County Council archives. A lot of councils have decent art collections, but they tend to stop around 1970 because that's when councils stopped doing things for the common good and started doing things because they had to. Um, so, and they didn't have to buy art, they had to empty bins, so they couldn't prioritise. Um, so I found that in our local um, archive gallery collection, we have six original Howard Cohen paintings. And my aim is to produce an exhibition that has those paintings, plus this more recent material and this pre-digital material here as well. And I think it would be a fairly unusual Howard Cohen exhibition because it would be absolutely pre-digital work. So we have a project there. And then cybernetic serendipity. We have a lot of background material. And then these are the artworks. So the classic um, artwork prints that came with cybernetic serendipity together with books <laughs> that were produced, contextualization materials and the music, um, and also ICA magazines and Studio International, which gives you a great contemporary art context for cybernetic serendipity. That is something I would like to produce in the future, a vision based around cybernetic serendipity, and so on. I'm not going to go through some of the others. You see, we've got a lot of, lot of good material. And at the moment, we have it safe. It's not in an ideal location. It's up two flights of stairs with no lift. Oh, um, no. It, wasn't much fun. it wasn't much fun getting it all there. Oh, my God. Um, however, I'm exploring two routes for a, a new space in Leicester. One is working with um, Montford University. Ernest is helping. Is Ernest around? Ah, great. Ernest Edmonds is helping um, broker, hopefully, a deal there with DMU. That would become our clean um, academic space. And also, I'm working with a number of other artists in Leicester to try and see if we can get a, 
a space where we can do work and exhibit things. Um, and that would be our sort of working space where the current projects we're on would be worked on. I want to involve lots of people in those. I don't want it to be a rarefied collection. I want to introduce, I would go in Paul Brown, to people who may not have come across that work before. Um, my sort of uh, practice as an artist is really to engage people in the work. Right, let's carry on a bit here. Um, exhibitions. So I think you would have maybe started seeing some of these CAS exhibitions popping up. Um, we started looking at the bottom there with the micro arts group. And this is just the last year exhibitions. Um, we then looked to, they then had Ernest Edmonds at 80 here at Moorgate, moved that exhibition up to Leicester. Uh, I've got a space now at Phoenix in Leicester where I can show work. We have the Paul Brown retrospective here in Moorgate, which has now moved up to Leicester. We then in Leicester first had the Quantel paint box exhibition, which is moving up here in December. And of course, we have the members show. Um, and all of those are well documented on the CAS website. Um, the Computer Arts Archive website, like I say, I think I'm going to move a lot of this content to the Computer Arts Society website. The Computer Arts Society, I think, is where you engage with the work and find out about it. Mm -hmm. The Computer Arts Archive is basically an index of stuff that we've got. Containing um, websites is quite time consuming. I don't want to really contain websites covering the same thing. So if I go here, see the Computer Arts Society website, click on there. We'll go into current exhibition, more on that later. And if you go here, you'll see uh, schedule and the exhibitions that we've run. Now, what we're trying to do with these exhibitions is they, are, they can be the lowest, I call it the lowest common denominator exhibition, which makes it sound not as good as it is, but we produce an exhibition of 20 reproduction prints and say to a venue, if you want to show this exhibition, that's the minimum you need, space for 20 prints. You provide the frames, we'll give you the artwork, contextualization materials. If you want to move up a bit, we've got videos for every one of these artists. But, um, we probably have live work that we can show. You can potentially have workshops. So I've been talking to Paul about creating <coughs> images in the style of Paul Brown in Scratch. So you can create quite convincing Paul Brown-esque images. <laughs> I'm not saying that that reflects on Paul's programming. Uh -huh. It reflects on um, <laughs> scratches. Um, but, you know, you recognizably Paul Brown. I'm not saying anymore. Recognizably Paul Brown <laughs> with scratch programming. And that excites me, the idea that kids can be taught programming by being shown how to um, create artworks. And of course, you can invite, they, the venues can invite the... Um, artists to come and give talks. So we've got a nice little selection of artworks here. And for each one of these, we are producing catalogues, which are free online, but they're printed versions. So I think our, our most successful one at the moment is the Paul Brown catalogue, available for £10 after this talk. <laughs> we also have one to go with the Pontel paint box exhibition. Um, I won't, I've got more I could say about it, but I won't, apart from it was a very important exhibition to put together. And we're even doing prints as well, so all round signed prints, £40, I don't know how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have a variety of things. Partly it's about giving people high quality materials at a higher price, but it's also ensuring that we document everything we do should be well documented. And all of these materials are a free download. So if you were putting on a Paul Brown exhibition or an Ernest Edmonds exhibition in, in the future, you'll be able to get a high quality catalog <clears throat> where the artist explains their work and so on. So as you can see, it's been quite a busy year. We've had a, a good year. Now that we're past lockdown, it feels like we're able to start doing the things um, I really saw the archive as being about. All right, almost next time. A minute. Um, what am I up to? Publishing stuff. 
Um, we've been publishing a paper at EVA every year, every year since 2019. Um, those papers tend to deal with um, general information about the archive, but increasingly projects that recreate, rebuild early artworks with the consent and involvement of the artist. So we've done a piece with Ernest Edmonds, um, Communication Game, a early 70s artwork where we've rebuilt the logic and the artwork using modern technology and the artwork is functional. It's a system-based artwork, so the system is intact. It's an original and consistent Ernest Edmonds artwork. We've just been looking at a Steve Scrivener piece, which I hoped we'd have in this exhibition, but um, it's on its way back from Australia where it's been um, exhibited and not available yet. I will put it up as soon as it comes back. And the next is looking at a piece of Paul's and Paul Brown's where they're going to um, reconstruct another early artwork. That is something I find very interesting, particularly as somebody who's interested in systems art, because digital art doesn't have to use the latest, shiniest digital technology. It has to have good ideas. And many of the good ideas could be 50 years old. The technology wasn't necessarily there to realize them fully, but they are still good ideas. And we should look at those with modern technology and look at reconstructing them, I think. That's a good way of understanding how the work operates. So there are the, there's a paper about Stephen Scribner's work in the current proceedings. Um, we're producing the catalogues, and I see that as an ongoing thing. Um, I'm working with um, Jonathan Bowen, and we're producing a, a sort of a collection of the previous papers and additional information as well. Right, finally, the Lansdowne project. I didn't know if I was going to show this, but I thought, why not? It might be worth doing. So you can't have avoided noticing that this is thing called ChatGPT, which is an artificial <laughs> intelligent artificially intelligent conversation AI. Um, it surprised me how quickly it's developed because I thought these things were coming along and I was thinking, oh, 2030, you might get something like that. And now it's 2023 and we've got something that pretty much would pass the Turing test, I think. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, it's amazing how quickly it's developed. Um, and I'd always wanted to create a website whose content could be accessed via um, uh, a, a conversational AI. So we've started doing that. We have a PhD student that I'm co-hosting in Leicester called um, Sean Carroll, and he started to take content from the archive and the CAS website and use it as a database for a large language model. And this one, I'm going to run live, um, is the first demo of what I'm calling the Lansdowne project. John Lansdowne, a bit of a polymath, um, great at talking, all those things. Lansdowne project is a bit of a it may not be called that in the end but I'm going to ask a question mm -hmm. so what is the you've done a typo there Sean it may confuse it let's see let's see um what is the, what is the art society <laughs> GPT, when you run the API, is a little bit slow. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to get it to read this. And of course, it won't take very long before we can train an AI on a voice of somebody. I think it would be a bit creepy if it was. We already do that now, but um, <laughs> we can have a more interesting Excuse me. Start speaking. I Sounds a bit sort of um, Doctor Who. <laughs> Maybe you can read it. So, it is a fairly good description of the Computer Art Society if you were living in 1975, because we've only put page magazines up to 1975 in here. So, I'll ask it. What does one sound do? 
John Lansdowne is a computer artist and member of the Computer Art Society. He's also the founder of the Richmond Arts Workshop. Is that true? <laughs> it lies. <laughs> so what? <laughs> what this is doing in quite a rudimentary way is you've got your large language model, chat GPT, and the issue, early issues of page are being analysed and turned into data that chat GPT can use in its um, inferences. And already it's starting to come back with some moderately interesting and quite believable um, statements. Unless you're trying to get in touch with them. Well, yeah, it, the tense is sometimes a bit wrong. Yeah. But remember, this is 1975, it knows about. When you've got all the um, pages in and all of these articles from um, the computer bulletin, all of the journals <coughs> that he wrote in, this and the other, we, and all the other stuff, computer art societies involved in, and all of the EVA conference proceedings and so on, we could end up with quite a uh, interesting way of exploring um, what would be a huge amount of data. Um, this is quite exciting. Uh, the PhD students making good progress. I'm making sense of the chat GPT API. My suspicion or expectation was that actually this would be a one-click button offered by, by Google. I would say on this website and these websites, and I would like uh, this personality, like a, a friendly teacher, um, and, boom, and I'd say generate a um, an agent, and it would take a minute or two, and bang, you've got it. Um, so uh, while I'm learning this, and I want to, learning it helps me um, make sense of it, my expectation is it will become very easy to do before too long. And at the rate things are going now, it could be a couple of years. Google AI will offer you a service, press a button, and it will scan a video, scan videos for the person you want to be the agent. It will get their voice and it will get the data and then you'll have a, a version of whatever we call the project, a nice friendly user agent that you can interact with. But that it's an ambition, but it's not necessarily the only thing we're interested in. If all we end up with is lots of great content indexed and usable, then I'd be happy with that as well. But as you can see already, this is a little bit interesting. So what I should now do is I turned a 20 minute presentation into 22 minutes. That can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> what I should now do is actually hand over to our main speaker who is Nick Lambert. Now, Nick has been chair of the Computer Arts Society 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, also worked on the Cash and Technocultures project, which saved all of that material and ensured that it had a good place to go to, which was the um, BNA. And we thought it'd be very interesting to give Nick, as he is our outgoing chair, yeah, an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the things that he's um, learnt and done over the years. So is that fair to say? So <laughs> your presentation on the computer here. Are you doing your presentation yes, on the Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, logs after yeah, if you're interested to the prints, it might be better to order them and I can deliver them in packaging and so on, but they are here if you want them. Yeah, I'll leave you to it. Oh, here we go. I can't see you can't see what I'm seeing, so maybe uh, do, yeah. how, how do you share the screen on this one? Yeah. 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 
actually got an infinite uh, infinite reach there, which I quite like. <laughs> Subjects of video art from the seventies, as I remember, that was all to the thing. Yeah, actually, not often. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Right Thank you, Gary. Okay, now Sean has introduced me. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes, I was my sins the chair of CAS for 12 years from 2010 until uh, well, last year when I decided that wouldn't have enough of a good thing. Yeah. And so the period of uh, being a cows was also the lifetime of my beard. I didn't have a beard before, and I decided to shave it off afterwards. So there we are. So <laughs> So we can say say that was a, beer, a beard's worth of, uh, of beard's time. <laughs> but <laughs> I've chosen this picture here. You might recognize Frieden Narka. This is actually him from uh, 2017 when we had Mark America uh, over to uh, talk about uh, his work, Grammatron. But um, I, I just like the fact that Frieda hits three essential points about digital art. Uh, computability, interactivity, connectivity, and I just thought his gesture about, uh, you know, looks like he's, he's he's risen again, so that's actually you know, quite a good place to start. And Ray Sergam to write again the Computer Art Society version 2, and really this is, um, you know, what we were engaged in doing over the, over, over the sort of course of the cash project was actually bringing the Computer Art Society back, and actually we didn't actually set out with that um, goal in the first place. I mean, the point of cash, the, uh, computer arts, context histories, etc. So Paul Brown, Charlie Gear, uh, Bruno Ferrin was the one who suggested this really, but uh, sort of got this moving. And of course, George Allen, whose company System Simulation played such a key role in preserving all of the works that we wouldn't have so much that we have today if it weren't for the fact that SSL had, has had a long lifetime, but also that George was committed to preserving what computer art society did. And the catalyst, sadly, was the death of John Lansdowne in 1999. And there was a sense then that a lot of the early history of uh, British computer art might be lost should that, you know, that, that happen, you know, and, and archives and other things being the ephemeral sort of piece, you know, sort of uh, ephemeral sort of uh, pieces of, of, of um, you know, organisation that they are, they, they might disappear. So we situated that project at Birkbeck. It was obviously where Charlie was based at the time, hence, and, and Birkbeck has continued to play a role, as, as you will see in this. Um, but the fact is that it was also my first job after doing my PhD. So I was, I was almost a new, newly, newly minted PhD at the time. I hadn't quite actually defended my thesis, but um, Paul and Charlie took a, took a punt on me actually turning out okay and um, offered me the, the role of a research fellow. So between me and Catherine Mason, who was the PhD on the project, um, the four of us started to reconnect and find again quite a few of these archives, caches, if you will, of early computer arts and discover really the people behind them. That was the key thing, was to discover who actually it was who made, them, made those works and also their, um, their connections to each other, their families, very importantly, their families. I think the people who preserved a lot of the work and then finally linking up with Douglas Dodds at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And it was thanks to Doug's good offices that um, a national archive of digital art was set up um, around 2005. So in fact, um, there was uh, you know an, an issue of page showing everything in the Sackler Center. I couldn't find a, a good digital copy as it happens, typical bit of archiving for me. I could find a very pixelated version, which I didn't want to impose on you today because it just didn't show the, the, the thing. But it was a day that gathered together the old and the new from the computer Future Art Society. And part of the reason, I'll just bring this up simply because it pulls together all the things that I've done in one very sort of busy image um, and all the places I've, I've worked at and been sort of thrown out of or, or, <laughs> or, or left in a huff. Um, <laughs> But the main thing is, you see that the CASH project, its successor project, Computer Arts and Technocultures, which is an important follow on, because as a result of what CASH did, the American art historian Patrick Prince um, offered her collection to the V&A. And on the back of that, then Douglas Dodds and myself were able to get further funding 
for that project and of course very importantly the involvement of Professor Jeremy Gardner um, who was the other sort of link pin linchpin in there then looking at a slightly later period of, of digital art and also that sort of American and international collection connection which um, Patrick had been doing because she of course set up the art or was running the art shows at Sigroff. Um, Copper Gilloff and others obviously had been, been doing those too. So there, there was a, you know, a strong sort of input there as well from tra uh, transatlantic side. And then that project ran from, um, if, if cash ran from 2002 to 2006, that project ran then from 07 to 10. Um, and that really sort of covers the period when computer art society started to revive. We revived it partly just for legalistic purposes, I, I, if, if, if it was to be sort of known, because we wanted an entity to be able to give these works that were in that collection of system simulation. Others, we wanted that entity to be able to, 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 to gift those to the, the Victoria Albert Museum. Obviously, the British Computer Society was very much, um, you know, an ongoing thing, but we wanted to show that there was still that sort of, um, that, that sort of need, really, to have a society dedicated to computers and the arts. And it had never really gone away, Cas, but it had sort of stopped publishing its, um, its, its magazine page. It had stopped the meeting regularly in about the mid-1980s. So there was a period when it went into, it was dormant. And by reawakening it, what we actually were doing, I think, was a number of things. So that was CAS 1.0. CAS 1.0, founded in 1968, up until about 1985. What we did, we... A few things. Firstly, we reinvigorated links that already existed, or had existed, I should say, between previous computer art society members, like, for instance, Alan Sutcliffe, whom you see there in the bottom right, with Stroud Cordock, another very important uh, figure who's obviously worked a lot with Ernest, um, Ernest Edmonds, and then just slightly cut off by the picture, but very important himself, Gustav Metzger, who was the first editor of Page magazine, and Gustav's input and from, from his often techno-skeptical sort of input in, into that uh, mix was, was, was most important in itself. We'll touch on that a little later. Top left-hand panel you see there on the left, Jeremy Gardner, and on the right, uh, Douglas Dodds. And then slightly obscured by my window, um, there we have Paul Brown, actually Paul's 70th birthday. Um, the cake, if you can't see it, is actually saying, um, it's in binary, isn't it? It had the binary numbers of 70 on, on the cake. <laughs> Pretty good. And there, not only Doug sitting there, but also slightly veiled in the background, Tony Pritchett, who we will touch on later. But these are all people that we kind of helped to reconnect, and therefore they started to be active again, which was brilliant. I think that really sort of gave new life to the work they did, firstly, and that, that was important. The second, I think, thing was for those uh, artists who had passed away, uh, their families, I mean, particularly Dorothy Lansdowne and her son Rob Lansdowne, particularly Olga Ignatovich and, uh, her, and, and, her son, and, and Richard Ignatovich as well. The, the fact is that they, they were um, key figures then in the whole... Um, you know, the revival of, of, of their um, the, the works that they, they'd kept. I mean, Olga in particular had kept all of this, this, this work um, almost untouched since 1988 when Richard Ignatovich passed away. And what we did, not only our work, but also Alex Ivanovich. And Alex was, um, you know, this researcher who'd uncovered the sensor and looked at, you know, this, this, this huge robot. He, he was so keen, you know, as a roboticist himself, trying to understand what the sensor was and why. why did, what, what did it do? How did Artovich develop it? And could it even be rebuilt? We will see. In the, it's sort of a, a good sequel to that, which we'll come to. On the left hand corner, yours truly, and of course, Catherine Mason as well. So, really, these are some of the key figures out of early uh, cash. And that revival happened, I think. Primarily because Paul was the chair of CAST from 2004 until 2009. Alan Sutcliffe got back into things. He really did a lot, um, especially with conferences like Bridges, um, the Mathematical Conference. Sue Golifer was uh, very key as well. Sue moving things along with ISEA, I mean, connecting us to, to, to that side of things and also Brighton and the, the work being done there. Um, also Janice Jeffries uh, running the Arts and Computing course at Goldsmiths. And I think her interest, the Thursday Club and the other things that she was running also connected us to that sort of, uh, you know, around the, around the 2000s, this great sort of upsurge of interest 
interest in the digital arts in London in particular. And I think the scene that we sort of came into was also ripe for that rediscovery. We, we were not operating in a vacuum, and I think this is very important. And um, people also within the University of the Arts, I should mention especially the course that Jonathan Kearney ran, uh, the computer arts course at Camberwell, uh, Richard Wright, um, and of course, uh, Keith Watson and Wolf Lisa and the Colville Place Gallery. And very sad, of course, um, to hear about Keith quite recently and uh, a great loss to, uh, to the digital arts in particular. But, you know, he was, he was doing something out of Colville Place and later on with Deluxe um, that nobody else was doing at the time. And that needed to be, uh, you know, that was offering us a centre for a lot of these things. Ernest Edmonds, of course, with roles both at Leicester and in Australia. And that was, I think, key to sort of giving us these uh, links into, into the contemporary academia, the work I did with Plymouth University and, and University of Wales um, at Newport. And then Catherine Mason um, published her book, A Computer in the Art Room, that tied together a lot of those early strands about the early educational sides of the computer arts as well. And then we published White Heat and Cold Logic with MIT. So those all, all those things were in play. Um, but of course, as I said, London itself, um, very much vibrant. We had Node London, Silicon Roundabout, everything that was happening, that sort of area. Um, Furtherfield as well. I mean, Furtherfield plays an important role for us too, that we bounce off Mark Garrett and the work that, he, that he's done and, um, and, and Ruth and uh, Ruth Catlow and, and really the, the things that they've, they've established um, are, are really important for us as well. And there were shows of, of net art at the ICA. So all, all, of, these, all of these angles were, um, were, were good for us. And the VNA, of course, um, 2020, 2010, I should say, decodes uh, digital design sensations. You know, a, a major thing we had uh, people like uh, Golden Levin and, um, and, and and many others uh, exhibiting there. But then alongside that, digital pioneers that um, Doug Dodds and Honor Bedard um, ran. Uh, that was very important in linking together that early history and showing, I think, to the outside world what that um, what a, a sort of a, a story, a narrative around the early computer art pioneers would look like. And that was actually a panel that we did at um, Isaiah in the Ruhr Valley in 2010. So that's um, Francesca Franco on the, um, on the right, Doug there, and myself on the left. You see, still beardless. So that was just, just prior to the period yeah. when, I, <laughs> when I took over at, uh, at CAPS. And then I think one of the other sort of uh, key things, of course, was working with the British Computer Society when they had their offices over at Southampton Street. And, you know, very much like where we are in Moorgate, of course, it's in some ways bigger and better. But I think being in Southampton Street at that time helped to cement a lot of those other links. And it was a very good place. Eventually, of course, Eva ended up working there as well. And we started working with uh, Eva when James Hemsley, who was at Birkbeck, started to make some initial connect connections to the CAP project, but of course I also did some early work with Jonathan as well, so those two things started to converge and um, Eva was being run at that stage at UCL by Suzanne Keane, but um, that was about 2007. But these, these, are, these other links were, were, were important too. Now, one of the things that um, kicked off, I think, my uh, time Cats chair, which I should say happened because Paul wanted to step down a slot rather similar to, to Lena, I've wanted to move, you know, sort of focus on your art and, and, and start to develop other things. But you stayed the secretary, which was really important for us too. Uh, but at that time, the uh, CAP project, Computer Arts and Technocultures, had um, run a, a one-day conference called Ideas Before Their Time. You can see there uh, Brian Reffin Smith as a sort of pathophysical zombie, of course, that's part of his, uh, <laughs> part of, part of his performance, which, which, he, which he gave at the start. But also, as I, uh, as I quote here, um, posing some really interesting questions. And if there was one thing I want to bring, or wanted to bring to my time, at um, Cas, it was this. Um, you see what Brian says there, uh, a mine, a treasure trove, a hoard. I cannot emphasize this too strongly of art ideas that emerged in the early decades of, uh, of I think, computing that still have not been remotely explored. Uh, we know how this happens. The next big thing comes along and the zeitgeist has its demands, things get left behind. So what I wanted to do was plug together things that were discussed in the early years of computer art society, which hadn't perhaps been visited partly because of the technologies of the time, partly because people's interests have gone elsewhere, because of social and economic pressures of various sorts, but there was much to be recovered. I still think there's much to be recovered. I still think, you know, the project that Sean is now engaging with, with the archives, will do that as well. I think we've only scratched the surface in some of the areas of interest. 
that things that they predicted way back in the late 60s, early 70s are only really now coming to pass, as we saw with chat GPT and other things. What then, what other ideas can be can be sort of uh, sort of found from that? And as you can see, I put the, the sessions in just so you can see who presented for us, but also the themes that we dealt with, cybernetics, time and, and, and time as a medium, time-based medium, uh, computer art and the spatial medium, um, computer art and the idea of output, in that case, the, the early days of 3D printing and other things. And then finally, technocultures, what, what it meant to have a sort of uh, tech, technological culture in, in the arts and, and, and how that could be developed. So just looking at some of the names involved there, especially again, um, Bruce Wands, another, another member of this community, um, really, you know, all, all contributing to something. And I wanted to capture that. And um, we have here then the um, decoding the digital was another important thing happening in 2010, just as I came in as well. So we were really, you know, we kicked off with a lot of meetings in 2010 that involved people who were key to what we were doing. So Barbara Nessim was one of the speakers, Roman Verosco, another sort of uh, regular contributor, and uh, and Ernest himself, Tina Gonsalves, and um, numerous other sort of uh, more recent um, art artists too. So 2010 was really the, the year of setting things in motion. I should mention also, I think it's the year that Sean got sort of properly involved with the cast as well. So, I mean, that started, I think, the ball rolling towards the archive as, as it emerged. And um, between 2010 and 2011, we, we, we worked, um, we did a number of things, unleashed devices, you can see there. Um, we were looking at uh, working with Tender Pixel Gallery, um, at an Illfield, Il who's gone, gone on to other things, but um, looking at uh, computational aesthetics, working with some contemporary artists as well as, well as those in the history. And um, finally, sort of uh, also going to Isaiah 2010 in the Ruhr as well. So there was a lot of activity going, going through that year. And um, into 2011, we started to engage with some of the other. Um, you know, exhibitions that were happening at that time, and the Connecticut Art Fair was one of the major ones. It wasn't digital focused per se, but a lot of the things within Connecticut crossed over into areas of interest of CAS and vice versa. And some of the um, some of the, some some of their more sort of performative uh, works were also, I think, of, of interest in the way that they use technology in in, in their work. Um, and the image just down to the uh, bottom left there, that's the Think Tank uh, Planetarium in Birmingham, where we engage with the Full Dome Festival as well. So the the, you know, the importance of, of new new media and new, new ways of displaying the digital was you know were, were sort of part of that offer that um, the CAS was making, and. Um, this was also when we started the work on the Turing um, centenary year, which, of course, Anna was a key member of, of, of actually sort of getting that off the ground, as was um, Sue Oliver and uh, Godana as well. So, um, oh, do you so. And I think that was, I think, perhaps one of the first times that we saw what could be achieved when we connected with the contemporary, but also without those ideas coming out of what um, Alan Turing rightly called intuition and ingenuity. Um, both, you know, we had something... Uh, uh, biological and morphological forms as well, but also artworks that ask questions of the um, of, of the robotic. And I shall move forward to that so you can see there's just, just some of the initial things that are happening at that stage. Well, I should also mention um, the talk by Ed Eduardo Casey about Valdemir Cordero, so that whole area of South American digital art is coming back uh, in, into frame and into focus at that time. Um, Alessandro Ludovico as well, New, New York Magazine, and of course, uh, Genetic Moon, who have also been sort of regular co um, collaborators with, um, with Cows too, uh, Nicola Showman and Tim Pickup. So, I mean, their sort of interactive works have been um, have been most important. But here we see the, you know, the, the lineup, it's sort of slightly blurry picky and, and a long time, yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, this, 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 this was a team, but pr primarily I think Anna and, and you and Gusano who put together that. And um, the first show was actually at Love Bites. And you can see there, I think, a sense of the range of work. They've got Sir Alex there showing the smoke and mirrors machine, which I was very fond of. It sort of projects lasers through fog, which I thought was great. And and and, and the robot, what's the name of the robot? The, um, right. uh, no, the, oh. the, the, the uh, face. Uh, familiar. Yes, indeed. Yes, that, that sort of sense of the uncanny valley and the way that uh, one can sort of change one's um, perception of robots when they actually wear your face. I mean, that was uh, that, that that I thought was most effective. And it works by Roman Verosco as well. And of course, Ernest Edmonds at the top right. I mean, everything there was something to do with that idea of generation, generative art and technological. In fact, 
So I had a, a good quote, which I ran, ran straight past. Um, yeah. We're looking for works that embody certain concepts that Turing either directly invented, such as um, computation, the Turing test, or was influential upon, like cellular automata and morphogenesis. So those were really the sort of the, the underpinnings of that very successful um, uh, exhibition. It toured quite widely. We helped to, to, to pull funding together for that, but also I think it fundamentally did something that I think the Computer Art Society should do in terms of its outreach and also its connections between artists. And this was another, coincidentally, the same year, I think 2012 happened to be a really good time for, for that for us. Um, this was Gustav Metzger thinks about nothing. As I said, Gustav had a foundational um, role in, in the early computer art society. Later on, later in life, he connected with um, London Fieldworks, a pair of artists. That was uh, Bruce Gilchrist and Joe Jolson. Um, and again, Brother Ferrin was also um, in, involved in this project too. And what they received the funding for was a piece whereby, as you can see, um, Metzger was, was hooked up to an EEG machine. But what that was doing was using his brainwaves to select various forms that then were amalgamated into that three-dimensional object. And then that three-dimensional object was milled out of. That became the negative, as it were, for the milling process that you see down there. A robot basically excavated that from a block of granite, um, sorry, Portland stone, which was then fused together and then presented as a, it was an object with a void in it, basically. And the reason it says thinking about nothing is they basically ask your staff to indeed still his mind completely still about nothing. They use that impulse to make the selection. Now, yeah. You know, may question exactly the validity of some aspects of that, but I do think it was, you know, it was well worth CAS's support and we got Arts Council funding towards it. But again, I think that linkage of um, the historic and the contemporary was, is, is very sort of fundamental to what we should be doing. So I was pleased to be involved with that. And the same year as well, Carol Fletcher, Manfred Moore had a significant show too. I should mention again, Carol Fletcher was another influential gallery when it lasted and really sort of helped to, I think, bring together a lot of elements of the, the, the London digital art scene. It's a shame it sort of went the way of so many others um, that have sort of had a period of fluorescence and disappeared. And this is another reason why I think it's important that computer, computer art society has a certain longevity because they can pick this up and keep, you know, sort of retain the memory of these things even after the actual uh, place and the exhibitions have ended. In 2013, um, we also, um, well, I've just, just mentioned, obviously, Elaine O'Hanrahan there, uh, daughter of D.P. Henry, who was talking top um, left-hand corner, who was talking about the early analog computing works that he did. He was using a bomb aiming computer in the 1960s to draw those uh, you know, very finely detailed uh, images, and um, was you know a, a complete pioneer of, in his own right. At the same time, that people like Ben Ben Leposky were doing the same thing with oscilloscopes, but quite independently. And I think as a sort of foundational, um, you know, sort of experiment in computer art, it's very important. He was rediscovered. Several shows followed, um, and um, that, that was you know sort of a, a key a key part of um, Cas as well. And um, also at the same time, we were working with Waterman's, with uh, Irony Papadimitriou, um, and Leash Devices it was a bit earlier than this, but it led to several other shows. Um, and also Patrick Tresse as well, who we'll come to in a second. Um, at the bottom, on the, on the bottom row, you'll see Peter Bales, a previous member of CAS, who came back to also discuss his systems work, and then juxtaposed with him, then uh, Bruno Martelli and Ruth Gibson, uh, now Gibson Martelli, but they were Igloo at the time, and uh, their, their 3D works also. And 2014 kicked off with um, the Digital Revolution show. And the input that we had there was slightly indirect in the sense that it was actually really poor brand who had um, in, input into it. But I think the fact they had a digital archaeology section through which you had to pass and saw in, 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 that, in that respect how... However, it was presented by Conrad Boltman, but I, I certainly think it was impactful in the way that it, it actually sort of laid out that, that uh, history of, of, of early interactive art. Um, and the fact it was at the Barbican was, was important, I think, for all of us in the sense that it gave the whole area a bit more of a, a profile. Um, so I think that was um, an important uh, moment as well. I should also mention um, there was uh, panel discussions about systems art, Ernest, um, Susan Tebby, Terry Pope, um, Sue Goffer and Stephen Scrivener, who are all both, you know, many of them, both computer artists and systems artists, talk about that very important group in, in, in the uh, early to mid-1960s and the work that they did. 
And through that, um, this also led to a, a further meeting fortuitously that was set up by uh, Genetic Moon, uh, where Kaz met with uh, Carla Rappaport, Lumen Prize for Digital Arts. And through that link, we then sort of started to have some further um, outputs and out outlets, as it were, with, with contemporary artists and uh, LinkedIn Kaz. But the other important thing that happened in 2014 um, was the documentary show about cybernetic serendipity. And this was important for the ICA to have recovered its own history in this area. It had for long overlooked the work of Yasha Reichardt, and I think had sort of buried a lot of the things that it did. And because it insisted on its contemporary nature, it seemed to want to just push a lot of its past into the memory hole. Um, but under Gregor Muir, who was the then director, uh, they had this documentary show about cybernetic serendipity, but more importantly, brought Yasha back. You can just see her there at the top of the staircase with Gregor, uh, making that link in. Very Pritchard, you see pictured there. Um, also, then, um, you know, it was important that he, as, as somebody who, who went to see cybernetic serendipity the first time around, but also his own sort of influences springing from that. Um, that's um, the work he was doing with Kate Sullivan at the time, to which I shall return. And then the panel session, then, that featured myself, Broner. Um, Jonathan Benthall, a key figure from, from that period, um, who was an anthropologist and art critic who wrote a lot about art and technology. Um, that, that, and with Yasha herself, we, we, we all met at the ICA to discuss that. So I think it was important to bring us into it as well. And then quite differently, jumping from the past to the present, the Lumen Prize uh, was, was expanding in, in all sorts of directions. Um, New York Tech Week, for instance, we did, did, did several shows there with, um, again, with Gibson Martelli, but also with the other artists who were winners of Lumen and juxtaposed against Caffini Castle, where they also had a show of works too. So Lumen was uh, really interesting in, 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 that, in that fact. And um, then we were obviously tying up, um, I think it was the first year that Andy, that, so you got involved in most you were involved with cows from about 2014. Uh, yeah, the year before, but yeah. Oh, the idea of, uh, In 2014. Right. Your morphogenetic works were also becoming, I, th I think that's when like, I started to see them see them more often. Coming into 2016, I'm sorry, this, this is a bit, bit of a, I, I started to do it chronologically. What the hell is the easiest way to <laughs> organize? Um, most importantly, um, you know, from, 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 from this year, I mean, the, um, the show, uh, Technology is not neutral. So again, um, co-production of Anna and Sue and Gudana, um, but importantly, yeah. and, and, and Irini. <coughs> it was Irini, Gudana and, and me. Curing. Right, right, okay. My, my apologies, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so both at the Phoenix Bryce and, and at Water. <laughs> of course, because it showed at Water, it must have been Irini, of course, yeah. But other, other, other artists shown there, Ghislaine Bonington, Susan Collins, Laura Decker, uh, Bavani uh, Pathy, uh, Judy Freeman, Kate, Gen Kate Genevieve, and then she was one of the artists who showed Luciana uh, Hale and uh, Nia Koff, and looking at a whole variety of interactions by female artists with technology, but particularly looking at the, I think, the biological and um, the interactive and, and, and understanding that sort of, you know, the, the view on technology that one, that one would have from that. So that, that was, I, I think, another um, way that uh, Kaus was, uh, you know, show, showing how it could sort of uh, be sort of active in, in, in the present. And at the same time, but that was 20, 16 or 17, I think it started in 16, didn't it? Yeah, two, two. It was, it was, it was that's right. Yeah. Because 2017 was another interesting year. This is uh, when we had uh, Mark America showing uh, his, his work. It was a retrospective of 25 years since Gravitron, which made me feel very old because, of course, Gravitron was one of the first works to, uh, to be associated with net art, 96, if, if, if memory serves. So um, basically, the, the work he did was um, shown actually at um, Southampton Street, but also this was the, um, a symposium he gave at Birkbeck and then followed on by panel sessions. You can see Mark Garrett in the, in, in the middle there was just discussing the, the importance of, of net art and, and, and that, that, that side of the, you know, that, that whole history really that sprang from the, the work that um, America did. Below that, we have the Ugly Duck Gallery, which was, um, I think, where Flux first um, showed a lot of their, um, their works. This was the year, I think, that we got involved with uh, of, of English and also uh, Afra Shemza and uh, Maria Almeida and um, really, the, you know, supporting their work through EVA. And this was another outcome, I think, the, the EVA exhibitions that we were doing annually. I think all of these, I hope you've got to see, is the way that these, these things feed in. These were 
you can show this here of Patrick Tresse's work and other robotic works at the Waltzmans Gallery. You've got uh, George Mallon and Sarah Mallon, Mallon in profile looking at the, uh, the robots. And then sadly, 2017, also the year that Tony Pritchard uh, passed away. And one of those things I think that illustrates perhaps the, the value of what the Computer Art Society has done archivally, Kate Sullivan, who's an animator and um, you know, very much in, involved in the history of the film, she had been working with Tony on a documentary, really about the early work he did. In case you didn't know, of course, he did the, the Flexipede, which is the earliest piece of character animation in, in, in the UK, as, as far as we understand. Worked on the Channel 4 logo, had many other sort of firsts um, in, in, into his name as well. Um, but he left a very significant archive, but he literally um, just passed away very suddenly. And that was uh, leaving leaving his house actually in the hands of a company where he, he sort of had the, um, you know, it was one of these decreasing term life things. So basically, and the, a company had the keys to his house, had to be negotiated by his family to get access to it. And then very, very swiftly, uh, Kate and myself had to rush in and save as much as we could of his films, of his documents, trying to work out in the space of less than a day, bearing in mind that Tony had squirreled things literally all over the house and we had to try and sort of pull, pull them out. Um, but that's a project ongoing till now. Kate is just in the process of, of pulling th those things together. The BFI are very interested in the film works, but the documentary side is something that we hope can go to Leicester and would be just sort of a, a key part of that archive. Um, and finally, just to show some of the works that Patrick was doing at the time, his, his drawing robot Paul had now sort of multiplied, and there were many of them, all of them engaged in sort of uh, copying, which I, I, I continue to be very fascinated by the, the work that uh, Patrick does with, with Paul. 2018 was the um, a key show for us. Um, this was actually um, at Brighton. This was part of the Brighton Digital Festival. I think showing for the first time really the coherence of the cows works that Sean has been putting, curated carefully in, in, into, into that show, which sat alongside then some of the Lumen works that were in, in another part of the, the exhibition. And I think the juxtaposition was very good. You can see the Ernest Edmonds data pack, um, a very early interactive work there, um, the, the documentary around it then, then framed. And it um, was well-timed to coincide with chance and control the v &A as well, which was um, also work that was being done by Melanie Lentz, who'd taken over from Ola Bedard there and working with Douglas Dodds and Mark Barr who'd uh, taken up um, Irene Dimitriou's previous role as the uh, digital curator as well. And this um, also marked uh, our involvement with the Digital Design Weekend. Um, they run in September and Kaz and Eva have both interacted very successfully with that side of the V&A. So that's a, a connection we want to keep keep alive because I think it's an important out output for, for us too. So, you know, I think you can see this that corridor shot on, on the, the left just happens to capture, I think, both Eva and Kaz working together and all, all you know, all of our all of our sort of parts in in, in action. Um, these interviews that happened in twenty eighteen. Um, David Upton, um, then doing his his, his MA at uh, UAL, was actually um, very keen, I think, to understand the backgrounds and the thoughts of um, a lot of digital artists. And you know, I think particularly by pu pulling together this this range of people involved, I mean. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's great to have, um, you know, sort of so, so many insightful conversations saved for posterity, I think, particularly in the case of some like um, Keith, who was sadly no longer with us, um, but to understand, again, the range of activities that um, the cows is, is engaged in. And I think a project that really, kind of, I think, is, is the summation of so, so many things that we've been building towards was the literal resurrection of the Sensor at um, AGH, University of Science and Technology in Krakow by uh, Dr. Anna Olszewska. But you see her there on the right-hand panel with Alex Ivanovich, both looking terribly happy at the fact that the sensor, which you can see in the background, is now functional. Bernard, of course, was, was there as, as, as was his parents and yeah. uh, you know everyone connected with, uh, you know, with, with, with um, Edward Ignatovich, and to be back in Poland, I think was, was a key part of this, that the, the sensor should be rebuilt there and also now is fully functional, and I'm hoping that it will tour, but it, it'll be seen by an even wider range of people. But it was, it was very special to be part of that, knowing that everything that we'd done, and Alex in particular had been doing, contributed into the work then that Anna was able to do, and pulled you know, her resources and her university's technical understanding together to basically, the story very in, in, in brief is that the, the, the sense to having been constructed for Philips for the Evoluon in the late 1960s by Edward Ignatovich, it was a 
many years ahead of its time as an interactive piece of robotic sculpture, uh, responded to sounds, that was part of its, its, its attraction, it responded in very subtle ways to, to, to different sounds and different noises and different directions. Um, Phillips ran it for se several years in the Evolion in, in Eindhoven in, in Holland, which was sort of their equivalent to the Epcot Centre that Disney had. Um, but eventually it became so popular that, in fact, they decided to gradually run it down and finally dismantled it without even telling Edward Ignatovich what had happened to it. For years it was presumed lost. And then it was discovered actually as a sort of gate guardian for a Dutch engineering firm. It was it had been welded into one piece and it was sat outside this, this company's headquarters in, in Holland, getting to progressively rusted by the North Sea sort of salt air um, and um, uh, basically several attempts were made to rescue it but finally HH University was able to raise funds to actually bring it back and make it fully operational reconnecting and reinventing things that had been lost um, re referring back to the original schematics and, and things that Alex had, um, had, had successfully um, rediscovered and producing a fully working version which combines both the original superstructure and new electronics and hydraulics and, and the whole thing is, is, is just remarkable and I, I, I would have shown a video we haven't got time but please look it up online um, and I do hope it'll, it'll come back to the UK at some point just to, on, on a tour at least and then simultaneously the Cows 50 show began with launch at Leicester and we can see there then pulling together all, all of all the strands of the archive um, We've got uh, Brian Reference, very pleased with the way everything was coming together. Stephen Scribner, too, and many of the other artists who'd been part of that Leicester group in the 1960s now again um, brought back together. 2019, kick off in the dark. That was. Um, that was a genetic move at the much lamented and lost now cello factory that was a great venue of its time, really good place for showing um, for, sh for showing interactive works and light works in particular. Uh, the point of In the Dark was, of course, it would happen in the uh, early months of the year when lighting conditions allowed those things to work very well. And that was the year of event two. And this had really sort of brought together, it was, it was something I think in, 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 in particular that... Um, was 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 a was a was a, a key part of what what Eva was doing um, for, for for some time, and I I think um, Graham in particular was sweating blood trying to get the <laughs> trying to get everything together, and of course with with our um, friends from the Royal College of Arts, and the, that connection was was super important that it should be. Event two would take place in the same place that event one, the original Computer Arts Society show of 1969, would take place. And this time linking up with Flux and also other contemporary artists and showing the Cows 50 collection in, in a place with also um, as much interactive work as possible and talks and other events. Three days, I think it was three days. It felt, felt longer. It was, yeah, ten days. It was ten days. It was ten days. <laughs> 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 and the number of speakers and this this, this timeline, I'm, I'm just giving it a little prominence because that was, that was my my contribution. But the main thing was pulling all those strands together to make to make to make event two happen. And I think you know we, we it was it was seen by a large number of people. It was running concurrently with Eva, but also um, you know sort of uh, very much a, a thing in its own right and attracted a huge, huge amount of attention. And I think also there, you can see on the bottom right, the um, when it moved to the v and during the digital weekend as well, the fact it was able to be shown there. And we thought 2019, you know, things are very much looking out for 2020. <laughs> you can only build bigger and better. Um, oh yeah, Yasha Reichart was, was a speaker at EVA that year as well, so that links in there. You see Afra Shemza, one of her works in the middle, and then just some of them here. You can get a sense of that place. Daniel Brown as well. Good, good to see Daniel there. Um, sort of also with the, the work that he's done since, and, and also in conjunction with Paul, as Brown and um, And just I think also li linking together past and present as well. Yeah. <laughs> and then you know, in 2020, I should say, did actually kick off with um, a show, the next in the dark, and the, therefore we, we, we were very uh, keen that uh, that should continue. But then everything went online. And, um, you know, I think Sean's response in particular to be able to get everything up and running, you know, really, really sh shows his, his commitment and dedication to um, especially, you know, what was going on at the time as well with, with yourself and to be able to do that and to keep track of uh, to keep track of all, all of that was, uh, you know, a testament to that skill and uh, knowledge, I think, to, to, to bring together so many varied speakers and to keep a programme going throughout 2020. And it continued into 2021 as, as we continued online. 
Um, but really, then we uh, sort of uh, move closer to the present and to my final um, decision to, um, to, 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 to move on because I felt, in fact, that it has developed a developed momentum. And you can see here the micro arts group that was um, most important and best work in bringing together and, and again preserving another archive. This, this time, the work of micro arts in the 1980s, um, online, early online community. Um, now being seen you know, for the first time in, in a gallery setting, um, the, you know, the micro arts project is itself another offshoot. And I think this is part, you know, coming to conclude this, this rapidly, but basically we didn't expect when we set off in 2002 that the cash project, you know, like some, you think many of these funded projects, they just disappear into history themselves. You know, I've been on a fair few that perhaps uh, <laughs> rightly or wrongly have disappeared into history. But the main thing is we, we don't actually think they're going to have an afterlife. And yet the afterlife of cash and the afterlife of the cap project was to give, to give the Art Society a second sort of wind and just sort of bring it back into the present and hopefully setting off lots of other, um, you know, sort of um, lots of other trails and, lots, and intersecting with lots of other lots of other pieces of work too. I think we, you know, we exist in an ecosystem, you know, we're not sort of doing this on our own by any means, but we have to, you know, I think with Eva as well, offering a sort of centre around which other things can, can, can work in orbit and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the sort of key thing is, you know, for those of us who value this interdisciplinary field, bringing all these things together, it combines art and science. It's the, the, you know, it's incumbent on us to ponder where we should go next, how we sort of take the best of the new technologies without losing sight of their, you know, their, 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 not only their, their, their sort of obvious downsides, but also their impact societally and otherwise, and also their artistic and aesthetic impacts, both for positive and negative sort of purposes too. I've been recently experimenting with um, DALI through the Bing um, interface just to see what I could do, in my case, just generating a, a set of tarot cards. But, it, you know, a small a small project there, it's, it's suddenly, you know, I started doing it late one night and I was still doing it sort of through, throughout the next day. It just came <laughs> out <laughs> trying to get, get the sort of images I was looking for. It was a very early sort of, for me, very, very sort of tentative dip into the toe of, of, of sorry, dipping my toe into the waters of AI. And yet that sort of gave me a sense of what is beginning to develop. And I'm seeing what's being done with mid-journey. I'm being seen what's being done in rudimentary ways of moving films, sorry, move, moving images through AI as well. Um, if you've seen the, the uh, intro sequence to Marvel's secret invasions and the controversy that's occurred around that, I think that's a, just a small, small foretaste of what's to come. Um, you know, where do we stand in terms of all these things? How do we value it aesthetically? How do we understand its impact? And um, the Greek words, um, it's, the, it's the, the root of our word economy, but it meant something more. It's called oikumene, which means the inhabited world. Often rendered ecumene, it captures something of the interconnectedness of human affairs in a holistic sense. I think we need to use our artistic and technological imaginings to recover some sense of the belonging that we should have within our own ecumene, the community within which we exist, and which has become so fragmented of late. And, uh, you know, I think the best glimpse of this is actually from Ursula Le Guin, whose tales of the spacefaring cultures take place within the ecumen. Her League of Inhabited Worlds. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of Le Guin's fiction, and I think that's that's a, a vision there. And there's just a couple more points. Grant me just two more seconds. Yeah. Well, CAS was founded at a transitional point for society, technology, and digital art. That was 1968 to 69. Thinking what would then happen in the 70s, the rise of new economic systems, the things that we're still living in today. It's a sort of 50 to 60 year span within which we are still, you know, perhaps that, that itself is drawing to a close in some ways. Uh, the CAS Manifesto, it's not here, but it's on the website. Do look at it in the archive. I think that should have a, a key place. It's the blue sort of um, piece of card on which sort of cat that was written out. It shows how the founders of it, including Gustav Metzger, in, anticipated many of the significant factors in the field of the computer. You know, we couldn't have foreseen these, these uh, profound changes that, that occurred even in the last three years as a result of being a very connected society. I think, you know, between 22 when I sort of stepped down and, and this year, it's an inflection point in the half century of cultural, economic and technological changes that have taken place since the end of the 1960s. How can we respond to those? I, do that if you... well, I think the CAS Manifesto, the original one, it's very broad in the way it defines computer art, and it doesn't ignore fields like music, it doesn't ignore fields like architectural performance or dance. So how can cows get to grips with a similar breadth of interest once more? And, you know, acknowledge what the society has achieved through its connections, through the things it's given rise to. 
And, you know, we're pointing the way now with talks about NFTs, AI, and many other things. So how do we sort of uh, find find that, uh, you know, as, as, as computing moves into the cloud, how does, how does cars sort of move with it? And how do we keep what we've achieved with digital heritage? And how do we sort of make that relevant going forward? Spout. 